please take your uh, copy of God's Word and let's turn together to uh, 1 Samuel in the 31st chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 31, uh, page 298 on the Pew Bible if that helps you. Beginning in verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchi Shua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And then his armor bearer, Saul, uh, or when, and when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw the men of Israel had fled and that Saul had, and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word. We thank you that uh, we have the privilege of being here and worshiping you this morning. Lord, just open our hearts and our minds to the message that you have, are bringing to us. Use the power of your spirit to uh, break through our sinfulness. In your name we pray. Amen. I would say that most people here this morning have heard the words, we now join our regularly scheduled program that is already in progress. Uh, and that's how the writer of 1 Samuel has what he has done here in chapter 31. He might as well have written, we now join the Battle of Gilboa, which is already in progress, because uh, in the Hebrew, it's in the present tense. It's going on. We join it as it's going on, it says here. And you can, in the KJV, the NIV, even the NSV, and, uh, and the RSV, they, they don't translate it properly. The only one who gets it is the New American Standard. So if you have that, you can go, yay, I'm right, okay? But but it is happening right now. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel. In other words, you and I, as the readers of the text, we show up late. We arrive late to the battle here. And I have a feeling that the writer made us purposefully late. He wasn't in a hurry to get to the slopes of Mount Gilboa. He could have made us uh, told about the battle. It would have fit perfectly into the timeline immediately after chapter 28. would have fit nicely. Instead, he spends two chapters with David on something that happened earlier. Now, why does he do that? Well, the chapter's downright depressing, isn't it? I mean, you read it, and it's, and it's a scene, I think, that he hates to tell about. Because, uh, I mean, I can't really blame him. Saul is killed. Three of his four sons are dead. Uh, The Israelite army is defeated. Uh, Saul commits suicide. His armor bearer commits suicide. Uh, The enemies of the Lord God win the day. They win the day. And we read this and we think, what does this defeat, what does this depressing text have to teach us about the Christian life? And trust me, I've pounded my head on the wall this week trying to figure that out myself. And with the Lord's help, we, I think there, pro, there might be four themes here. Uh, the faithfulness of God's servant, the fulfillment of God's word, the problem of God's honor, and the kindness of God's people. The kindness of God's people. First of all, the faithfulness of God's servant. And that's found in the first reported casualty of Mount Gilboa, Saul's son, Jonathan. Now, if I was writing his uh, obituary or putting something on his headstone, it would read, he remained a true friend to David and a faithful son of Saul. 
And if, if you have been paying attention through 1 Samuel, how is that possible? To be a true friend of David and a faithful son of Saul when they're nothing but enemies. I think he was able to do this because he understood that the kingdom didn't belong to David, the kingdom didn't belong to his father, and the, it, the kingdom belonged to God. It wasn't his kingdom to seize from David, and it wasn't his kingdom to seize from his father. Instead, his place was to serve David and Saul, and most of all, to serve his Lord. So he surrendered the kingship over to David, and he gave his life in battle for his father Saul. And in the middle of this hopeless situation, Jonathan was nowhere else but the place that God had assigned him. And that was at the side of his father. Now it all looks tragic. It all sounds so sad. But maybe it's not as tragic as we think it is. After all, what's tragic about being faithful to the calling that God has placed upon you? With all the things that come with it, what is tragic about that? Being where God wants you to be, serving where God wants you to serve. What's tragic about that? What was it tragic when Jonathan laid aside his right to the kingdom of Israel, which he could not have to gain entrance into a kingdom that he could never lose? Was that tragic? Jesus said it this way in Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Jesus says, I've got it here somewhere, Matthew 16, 24 through 26. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would lose his life, will, would save his life, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? How will your obituary read? Will it read, he clung to the, king, to the kingdom of himself and he died with the most toys? Or will it read, she exchanged the kingdom of this world and gained entrance into the kingdom of heaven? As I looked at all this, I was reminded of uh, the story of Jim Elliott. Some of you may know who he is, missionary to the, uh, I, I don't know if I can say it right, but the Akua Indians in South America. And he was speared to death by those people as he brought them or attempted to bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And before he even died, in one of his diaries, he wrote the following. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. The rest of the story surrounding the death of Jim Elliot is that his wife Elizabeth continued the work with the Auka to reach them with the gospel. And eventually, while she was there, she witnessed to the men who murdered her husband, and they were converted to Christ. And then she lived among them for years. Such is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you want to hear about that, the movie, there's a DVD, what is it, The End of the Spear, The Point of the Spear? That's the story about that, and I encourage you to see it. Next we see the fulfillment of God's word, the fulfillment of God's word. And at the beginning of verse 3, we hear the gruesome details of the disaster. And the verbs push the story along. They tell the story. Israel flees three times. They have fallen four times. They were struck down. They were killed in verse 2, pierced through twice. We read of their dying four times in these verses. Saul, you know, stripped of their armor, cut off from their people. Their bodies were nailed to a wall. And in the middle of all this, Saul pleads with his armor bearer to take his life, to finish him off. But he refuses to touch the Lord's anointed, so Saul falls on his own sword. So Saul has died, his sons have died, his armor bearer has died, Israel has been whipped, they've been thoroughly and completely defeated. And you read that and we think, well, these things matter because they're sad. But it's not simply because they're sad that they matter, they matter because they are the fulfillment of God's word. Now the reality that these sad events are the fulfillment of God's word might sound strange to 21st century ears. I mean, this is, this is terrible stuff. But that's what 
the scriptures are teaching us here in 1 Samuel. Now, how so? Now, you might remember the prophecy of Samuel to Saul when Saul went to the medium of Endor and asked her to call up Samuel for him. And Samuel prophesied, and you can look at it, you just got to turn back a couple of pages to, uh, to uh, 1 Samuel 28 in the 19th verse. And Saul, uh, Samuel said to Saul, Moreover, the Lord will also give over Israel with you into the hands of the Philistines. Therefore, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. He's dead. So he's telling them, you're going to die. Indeed, the Lord will give over the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. And that's exactly what happened. So just as the word of God announced the end of Hophni and Phinehas, way back in chapter 4 and verse 11, and that word found them, so the word of God has found out Samuel, Saul and his sons here in chapter 31. The army of Israel may fall before the Philistines, Saul may fall upon his sword, but the word of the Lord will never fall. It will endure forever. It will and it surely has come to pass. And this is a reminder, this passage is a reminder to us that God's word not only comes to pass in regard to the blessings that we seek to him or from him, but in regard to his judgment as well. You know, we like to talk about the promises of God and his blessings to us. We enjoy that, don't we? I like it. You know, we want to hear that the Lord will bless us. We want to hear about his love. We want to hear about his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy. But it's hard to listen to God's promises of judgment and wrath. You call judgment and wrath a promise? God's judgment and wrath? You call that a promise? Yeah. How can the Lord have the promise of mercy and grace apart from the promise of his judgment and of his wrath? If there's no judgment no wrath, there's no need for mercy. There's no need for grace. If there's no justice given to those who oppose God, to those who live in rebellion to God, those who live uh, against his word and against his will, those who are plainly evil, then the good news of the gospel, the good news of God's forgiveness is no news at all. It's no news at all. Without the promise that a righteous and holy God will bring judgment and wrath to bear on the sin and evil of this world, the good news of the gospel of grace is nothing more than a, good, than a God, I don't know, that's like a doting grandfather that pats you on the head and says, don't worry about your sin. It's no big deal. That's all it is. And this is the sort of God that is proclaimed in our secular society. And make no mistake, we are living in a secular society that proclaims the gospel of tolerance. The gospel of tolerance. In the name of tolerance, it's proclaimed that you can believe whatever you want to believe, or if you don't want to believe anything, you don't have to believe anything. I mean, the gospel of tolerance says that God will overlook your sins. And some say there's not even a God, so you don't even have to worry about it. Let me ask you. Would a God who did not care about the difference between right and wrong be a good and admirable being? Would a God who made no difference between the Hitlers and the Stalins of this world and his own saints be morally praiseworthy and perfect? Moral indifference, I think, would be an imperfection in God, not a perfection. There is a God, beloved. He is holy and he is righteous. And the scriptures promise us that God will judge each and every one of us. Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4 beginning in verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God knows your thoughts. He knows what's in your mind. He knows what you think you might want to do, but you don't do. You know, that's why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you're guilty of adultery just because you have lust in your heart. You're guilty of murder because you're angry and you don't forgive your brother or your sister. 
It's your thought. It's your intention. God sees it. That's what it says here. And then verse 13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Have you availed yourself of the grace of God through Jesus his Son? Have you cast yourself at his feet? Have you confessed your sins and sought the forgiveness that only he can provide? If not, you're subject to the wrath of God. You'll face the, Lord, the Lord's judgment. And the Lord has promised to fulfill his judgment. You say, well, there's more. The, 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 that, I don't like that God. That's the God of the Old Testament. You need to read your New Testament a little more closely. The impending coming of Jesus Christ, his, his second coming, hangs over the New Testament. It is there. He will return. Read the Revelation of John. Read First and Second Thessalonians. One day he will return without sin unto salvation. And he will come and he will judge the people, young and old, rich and poor, race, creed, color, nationality. None of that will matter. We will stand, all will stand, believer and unbeliever, before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, as we move on in our passage, we see the Philistines, they, they're swarming over Mount Gilbea like, uh, like, I don't know, like bees on honey. And they're collecting the spoil, spoils of war from the bodies of the Israelites. And in the process, they discover the greatest prize of all, the body of the king, King Saul. They chop his head off, they strip him of his armor, and they parade him around the country proclaiming the good news of their victory in every temple and every town. They took his body and they fastened it to the wall of Bethshan. You can read that there in verse 10 of this chapter. And the message is clear, isn't it? The gods of the Philistines have won. They have won. The gory head belongs to God's anointed. The armor of, of Israel of Israel's king is in the temple of Dagon. It's in that temple. God could not protect him with that armor. Israel is gone, defeated. There's absolutely no question as to how the media people will spin this in Philistia. If God's king and God's people were defeated, well, you know what? The God of Israel is defeated. He's nothing. Never mind that the gods of the Philistines are nothing more than hunks of wood or pieces of stone. The pagan evangelists are running all over the place, all over the countryside saying, the Lord is a loser. The Lord is a loser. So the tragedy and the sadness of this story is not only found in the fact that Israel has been crushed, Israel has been defeated. I think there's a deeper sadness, and that is, is that God is being mocked. Every true believer mourns over that. Worse than Israel being defeated it's God's disgrace. And I think the same is true today. When the church is, quote, defeated, God is mocked. We as the children of God, when that happens, are to mourn the disgrace that is brought upon God and his church. When a prominent Christian leader experiences a moral failure, it is more than that person who's brought to shame. It is more than the church that is brought to shame. The name and the character of our Savior is brought to shame and is disgraced. And it can happen on a personal level, on an individual level. You know, we say something that may or may not be true. We, we exaggerate a little bit. We laugh at off-color jokes. We participate in, in the local gossip. And then somebody who's an unbeliever, they look at you and they say, well, I thought he was a Christian. I thought she was a Christian. Well, if that's what being a Christian is, then what's the point of being a Christian? It doesn't make any difference. And so God's name is drug through the mud. Now, I have to be careful here and say that uh, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have perfection. But is your life headed in the right direction? Are you sorry for your sins? Are you, are you repentant of your sins? Because the unbelieving world is watching. They're watching. And when believers unrepentantly, unrepentantly live and behave like unbelievers in the name of Christ, the witness of the church is stained. When the behavior and lifestyle of the world 
infects the church and infects the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church and its word and its promises are, are brought into question. They become suspect. When we, when a church says that, I don't know, what comes to mind here, okay, it's okay for you to ordain the LGBTQ community into the gospel when the word of God goes plainly against that. It's okay for you to live together outside of marriage. That goes against the word of God. And we put our approval on these things. We are becoming like the world. We are allowing the world to infect us instead of us infecting the world with the gospel. We are to be the ones witnessing. How can we proclaim that the gospel of Jesus Christ makes a difference in our life when there is no visible difference in our life? You know, oh sure, you go to that building once or twice a week and you sing some hymns and you hear some guy get up there and pontificate for a little while and you get all jazzed up, but you know, on any random Tuesday, your language sounds like my language and the fact that you're doing all of these things, you know, living together and and endorsing everything that's not in the Bible, you go to the same movies, you read the same books, you laugh at the same jokes. So this God of yours and his son, Jesus Christ, big deal. As a church, our goal is to bring honor and glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ at every opportunity, which means that I and you and I all of us together as individuals must be, as believers, we have to seek to bring honor to the Lord Jesus Christ because people see the church through us. We are God's ambassador. You know, an ambassador to a foreign country, a foreign nation represents that nation in the country. Guess what? We're aliens and strangers in this world, aren't we? This world is not our home, so we are ambassadors here. You might say the church here this morning, that's our embassy. We come here and we find safety, we find security, and we worship together. But we are here to represent Christ. Again, in no way do I mean to make it sound like that you're supposed to grit your teeth and, and live for Jesus or the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket because you did something wrong. No, there is grace, there is forgiveness. What I'm saying is, is by the power of that grace, by the power of the Spirit, God's people are to live in this sinful world as witnesses for him and by every definition found in the scripture that means that we're different first peter 2 9 in the king james version i like that it says we are a peculiar people i can't speak for yourself but i looked in the morning the the, the mirror this morning and i saw a very peculiar person okay i see some amens out there well thank you for that encouragement all right then if <laughs> but our calling from god is to be different, is to be peculiar. And what is that calling? 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Why? That you should proclaim the excellencies of, or the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what we're called to do. That's what matters, whether it involves the church body, whether it involves us as individual believers, whether it's on Mount Gaboa or here in Kingston, Tennessee, whether we're around the Philistines or the Cumberland Presbyterians, be they believers or unbelievers, the honor of God himself must be at the top of our agenda. Next, final verses of 1 Samuel, amen, coming to the end. Final verses here. We see, I think, the kindness of God's people. The kindness of God's people. Verses in 11 through 13, I think, are as close to uh, any note of tenderness in this chapter that we will find. When the men of Jabesh Gilead heard the story about how the Philistines had defeated Israel and the bodies, the mutilated bodies of Saul and his sons had been nailed to the wall at Bethshan, uh, they would not and they could not stand idly by. So what happens is some brave men uh, hike all night, and I think it's 11 miles one way if I looked at the map right. So it's a 22-mile hike, and on the way back, they were carrying with them four, the bodies of four grown men. Now, why would they do that? Well, you've got to remember what happened earlier in this story. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 11, the 
apparently these men had never forgotten that Nahash, remember Nahash the Amorite, who wanted to do optical surgery on the people of Jabesh Gilead, here's your options, we'll gouge out your right eye and you become our slaves, or we're going to kill you. Those were the options. And what happened? Saul, his first act as king, was to call the armies of Israel together, and by the Spirit of God and the power of God, he rescued the people of Jabesh Gilead. It was a debt of gratitude. A debt of gratitude. Paying that debt couldn't undo what happened on Gilboa. But as you read verses 11 through 13, you can't help but get the feeling that the actions of these men was the only right thing to do. It was, it was the right thing to do in the middle of this. Gratitude, I think, carries its own ought, whether it changes anything or not. You know, some things you do just because it's the right thing to do. You do it because it's the next right thing to do, whatever the circumstances might be. The women who kept watch at Jesus' crucifixion, they couldn't do anything, but they were there. When they watched him being placed in a tomb, they couldn't do anything, but they saw what happened. They took spices to anoint his body. They didn't know how, he would get, how they would get into the tomb. Who's going to move the stone? Love offers the kindness it can. Love doesn't forget, even in the face of death. You know, the next time you go to the funeral home and you're standing there in line and you think, I don't know what to say. What can you say? My advice to you is don't say anything. Because I've heard a lot of stupid stuff said in funeral lines. Hold their hand, hug their neck, cry with them, take them something to eat. Show the kindness of God to them and offer that to them. You'll never know what a comfort you are to someone when you do that. We come to the final verses again, 1 Samuel. If you're like me, is this how it ends? Really? Is that it? 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel ends with a funeral. It ends with a funeral. Israel defeated. Its leaders dead. Leaders buried. And I read this chapter and I reread this chapter and it was just thoroughly depressing. <laughs> and I finally remembered, or I was probably more accurately, the Lord brought to mind that uh, originally there wasn't a first and a second Samuel. There was just Samuel. And what happened was, is the scroll was so big that they had to find a place to cut it off so you could carry it. <laughs> one person could carry one part, one person could carry the other part. So they made two scrolls, one first Samuel, one second Samuel. And while the death of Saul is a natural break in the text, we've got to remember it's not the end of the story. Second Samuel, the first part of it, tells us about David's rise to power in the kingdom of Israel. In other words, the ending of 1 Samuel is really just a glorious beginning for what's to come. Because Israel becomes one of the strongest kingdoms in the world. It reminds me of another story. The Gospel of Christ. Friday, it looks like the end, doesn't it? One of the disciples or the disciples thought, you know, this guy is the coming Messiah. He's the king of kings. He's going to usher in the kingdom. He's going to establish the kingdom. And now he's dead and gone. I watched him die on a cross. I watched them put him in a tomb. I watched them seal that tomb with a stone. And then they put a Roman guard on it. Is that the end? The disciples on the road to Emmaus thought that because one turned to the other and Jesus was there. They didn't know he was there. But they said, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Is this how it ends for Jesus? Is it curtains for the kingdom? Well, we all know the answer to the question, don't we? The darkness of death and the gloom of Friday afternoon are transformed into the glorious resurrection of Sunday morning. What looked like the end was really only the grand and glorious beginning. And we're still living in the midst of that gospel because one day he will return. I wonder, do you know this Jesus that transforms disastrous endings 
into new beginnings. Do you know that Jesus? Do you know this Savior who alone can forgive you of your sins? The Savior who took upon himself the judgment that you and I deserve. Will you turn to him? Even now, will you confess your sin and cast yourself on the mercies that only he can give? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life must lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. Gracious God, we thank you for your mercies to us. We thank you that you are the God who forgives us of our sins, the God who uh, can take the disastrous parts of our life, the sinful parts of our life, the places where we think and believe or, or uh, that we have just made a mess and that there's no way, no how, that things can ever be set aright. But Lord, you're the God of grace and forgiveness. You're the God who forgives us of our sins. You're the God of new beginnings. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Christ's name.